More and more B2B marketers are running paid ads, but when it comes to experimentation, most are barely scratching the surface. So on today's episode, we're going to give you a ton that you can steal from us so you can start experimenting with confidence. Demand Gen U is officially in session. Let's do it. So we've got a special guest today, and I, I don't think he knows this yet, but I promise you, you're going to be seeing more of uh, our special guest on Demand Gen U. We've got Silvio Perez, our head of performance marketing at Metadata. What's going on, Silvio? Hey, how's it going, Mark? Happy to be here. Yeah, this should be a good one. I think, uh, what was it, a few days ago, you kind of made your announcement on uh, DGMG, and I, you kind of uh, announced yourself with a bang with some experimentation bombs, so I'm excited for this one. I'm pumped, honestly. Like, I, This is something that I talk at nauseum with uh, behind the scenes, so I'm excited to like talk more and get it out there. <laughs> yeah, this could be like a mini series, so I may sign you up for this. But uh, on today's episode, we're just going to get into like where do you get started when it comes to experimentation? Uh, and I think we want to riff a little bit on the four buckets of people that like we typically place B two B marketers in. You know, when it comes to experimentation. So, Silvio, feel free to tell me if uh, you think I'm full of shit here. But there's four of them uh, that come to my mind. So the first one being, you know, you're intimidated by experimentation and you don't know where to start. I know yep. I personally fell into that bucket before. Uh, the second, you know, you're experimenting, but you're not experimenting enough or there's not enough uh, you know, process behind it. The third bucket being they're experimenting a ton and unfortunately not moving the needle. And then the fourth, uh, congrats if you're in this fourth bucket, but they're experimentation pros. Uh, I think you're probably in that bucket, but I would not put myself in number four. The only thing I know is the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. <laughs> so I appreciate that. <laughs> well, uh, this is gonna be the Silvio Perez show today because I know firsthand uh, from working with you on our own campaigns at Metadata, there's so much that I personally learned and I know that our customers learn as well. So we probably could charge for this, but this is a free podcast. So uh, <laughs> let's get into it. So Silvio, you talk to uh, a ton of our customers. Um, when it comes to experimentation, what's your take on where people generally fall into these four buckets? Yeah, uh, I think the first place people fall under is I would say the intimidated part and then also testing too much but not gaining much from it. So on the intimidation piece, I, one of the things I always tell Metadata customers and is like, you can't scale complicated. You have to keep things simple. You know, the, the enemy of complexity is clarity and the more clear and simple and repeatable you can make things, the easier it's gonna be to, you know, create a predictable result. So that's the biggest one for most clients is they're just intimidated it's their first time, right? Maybe they're like a new demand generation manager at a company and you know, they have to be responsible for this. And then on the other piece, you have, I would say ambitious, you know, directors of demand gen or performance marketing managers, growth marketing managers, different titles that, you know, they're really anxious to drive results and they're testing a bunch of things. You know, they're, they're testing multiple variations of ads, and unfortunately, they'll fall into the trap where they're testing for the sake of testing and they're not necessarily testing for the sake of learning and for the sake of adjusting and pivoting. And they're not prioritizing the elements that are going to drive them the greatest lift. I may or may not have fallen into that bucket <laughs> at my last job, so I can definitely relate to that. So I think one of the, the biggest questions that I had you know, when I was trying to start experimenting how do you get started? You know, what are the, let, maybe let's start with what are some of the wrong moves to make and where do you see um, customers or B2B marketers uh, try to start experimenting? And then we can get into what are the right places uh, and kind of right ways for you to get started. Yeah, step one, and this isn't even just like with paid advertising, this is just marketing strategy. Step one is to decide on your outcome. And I say outcome because it's tied to a specific result. Sometimes when we just say goals, people don't assign it to an outcome. So, you know, an outcome goal. What is the exact result that I want to achieve? In my experience, just working with B2B SaaS clients, I've kind of broken it down into like five core outcomes that everyone is essentially trying to achieve. So outcome number one is they're trying to create demand. Outcome number two is they're trying to capture demand. Outcome number three is they are trying to revive demand. Outcome number four is they're trying to accelerate demand. And then finally, outcome number five is they're trying to expand demand. So by breaking it out like that, 
you're able to understand, hey, what is the core outcome that I'm trying to you know, optimize for? And then based on that outcome, it's going to influence your strategy. There's gonna be certain channels that you use, certain campaign objectives that you use, and certain tactics that you use in order to facilitate that growth. And then also based on the outcome that you're trying to drive a difference in, your KPIs will change as well and how you go about measuring those different outcomes you're trying to optimize for. When you have the five outcomes like this, I think of it as like building your paid infrastructure. So it's almost like I call it your plumbing, your paid plumbing. So by breaking it out this way, you can really understand which aspects are you trying to focus your campaigns on to be able to like deliver that personalized messaging and really meet people where they are in that buyer's journey. I think we just came up with a good social card that's going to have Silvio in like a plumber's uh, uniform uh, because I was just on a call with you the other day and you were talking about plumbing. So when it comes to plumbing, where should people jump in first? Because you're talking about different ends of the, like, let's say the demand spectrum, if you will. Uh, where do you recommend that people jump in first? Because yep. they probably shouldn't do all five at once. No, definitely not. And most people don't have the budget to do all five at once if you're just getting started. The first place I recommend everyone starts is capturing demand. I, I call capturing demand the way I like to think about it. I like to keep things super simple is think of it as like keeping the lights on. You know, if you're trying to create demand first, that's going to be a very painful conversation with your CEO or like your VP of marketing or your CRO, whoever you're reporting to, because they're interested in this quarter. Right. And if you're creating demand is a long term strategy. So first to give you that that bandwidth and that buffer to be able to start to do more top of funnel actions like creating demand, focus first on capturing demand. So there's a good like there's this famous copywriter. I can't remember who said it, but it went more along the lines of like if you have to sell a hamburger, start with the people who are hungry. You know, the same goes for you and your whatever you're selling, whatever your software tool is. So start with the people who are in market that are already know they have a problem, right? And they're looking for a solution. So keeping it even more practical than that, what does this look like? This looks like paid search, right? People looking for solution related keywords, people looking for your competitors, people looking for your brand. This looks like paid review. People going to websites like G2 or Captera, and they're looking for software, right? Based on certain categories, and they're trying to find software that's gonna help them solve their problem. This also looks like paid social. I know a lot of people say you can't capture demand on paid social, but I don't think that's true at all. I personally have spent more than $300,000 a month for certain clients just on demo requests on paid social, capturing demand. So, and really how soon and the trap to, that people fall into with capturing demand, and this is kind of like the whole demand generation conversation right now in, in the B2B world. The problem with capturing demand is if you stay there. It's bloody, it's messy, it's competitive, and, and it's very expensive, right? It's a finite game. There's only so many people in market, and what's gonna determine how soon you hit that scaling wall in terms of capturing demand comes down really to like your, you know, your average deal size and your total addressable market. You know, if you're a, a, like a product-led growth company with a massive TAM, let's say like Asana or a Monday.com, your TAM is massive, right? Uh, anybody who's managing a team can use Monday.com as an example, right? Not not to plug them, but like as an example. And we are not Monday cust Monday.com yeah, customers. We're not, we're not. I like their ads, though. Um, <laughs> they have good ads. So essentially, like depending on your TAM, that's going to significantly impact how much demand there is to capture, right? Some people say it's like three percent of any market is ready to make it like a purchasing decision. Other people say five percent. The answer and the, the truth be told is no one really knows. Um, but more or less, the bigger your market, the more you can focus on capturing demand. The problem is you don't want to stay there because, you know, that's, again, it's the most expensive. Everyone's bidding on those keywords. Everybody's bidding on those review listings. And on the paid social side, in terms of capturing demand, what does that look like? That looks like remarketing anybody that left your pricing or demo page, right? Uh, that looks like using intent audiences to get in front of those people. That looks like cold prospecting with conversation ads and a gift card, right? So all of these things are different tactics that you, you can use to be able to capture demand through social. So we, I mean, we admittedly sell to a lot of SaaS companies, so they're interested in demos at the end of the day. And I think people, all they're interested in are, hey, how do we generate more demos? So you can get them started with, you know, the capturing demand focus. 
But how do you move them away from capturing demand to some of these other stages that you mentioned? Because if only it were that easy to throw a bunch of money into a you know a paid advertising platform and generate demos, like we probably would all be out of jobs because <laughs> you know it was so easy to do. So how do you uh, educate customers and other people that you work with to kind of move them away from? All right, we've got capturing demand you know down. What's that next step? So the signs of when is it time to start to go higher up in the funnel and start creating demand is you almost don't have to tell them because like it'll it'll present itself in the way of hey like we're not able to scale this campaign any further right depending on your audience size it's going to dramatically change so maybe you're spending let's say three hundred dollars a day on, a, on a, an audience and you can't get to four hundred dollars a day and guess what your budget just increased because you're doing a great job at driving pipeline and it increased from let's say 100 grand a month to 300 grand a month and you're trying to you know get more scale out of your existing campaigns and your existing audiences and you just can't right like there's just only so many people there and then you start to try these different strategies and tactics but hey guess what not everybody is ready for a demo so the cost per demo is too expensive and it's not able to meet your unit economics of you know what a break even cost per demo should be so those are the kind of like the signs of hey you've kind of tapped out here and now you really need to start to focus on creating demand and really building that that no like and trust in your market so that way when these people go and they're you know in solution mode and, and they're more in the capture stage guess what hopefully they'll just go to you because you were there for them in the beginning right before they even knew they had a problem so for some of those let's say leading indicators mm -hmm. do you is it typically like a fight that hey, you know, you should expect to see these and, you know, maybe some of our customers or, or others are saying, no, like I still want to keep all my budget here. Do you have to kind of let it play out over time and, and let them see those leading indicators themselves mm -hmm. or is it an easy sell? Sometimes you have to let it play out over time. For the most part, what I'm actually seeing more of right now is because there's a lot of conversation around like, demand creation and brand awareness and all these things, I actually see it's a little bit of the opposite right now. I'm seeing a lot of uh, B2B SaaS companies like trying to drive awareness when they still have so much opportunity left on the table, so to speak, and they're not capturing that demand. So it's kind of funny how like the dynamics is changing a little bit. Um, so it's like, you know, take advantage of all this because it's basically low hanging fruit, right? And then, of course, and if you can do both in tandem, that's even better if you have the budget to support it, right? Ideally, like 10 to 15% of your monthly budget, easy way to get started, just allocate that to demand creation and really starting to get your brand out there. So you mentioned budget, and I know this comes up in DGMG all the time. It comes up on LinkedIn. How do you budget for some of these different uh, stages? Like, it's always a question that people are either thinking or maybe too embarrassed to ask, but it comes to budget at the end of the day, and most B2B marketers don't have endless budget. Totally. So, you know, the, the reality is, too, with these stages, the biggest bucket that you're going to be spending the most of your money, mon uh, money on is prospecting, which is like capture, right? So in terms of like a general allocation that you can do, is essentially, and this is going to depend on your goals too, right? Like if you're trying to focus on net new uh, versus expansion, et cetera. But what I always recommend to clients is like, just put, if you have, let's say $10,000, right? Just put, let's say 60% on prospecting and then divvy up the rest across all the other buckets. And that's like an easy way to get started. So that way, at least you're hitting those different segments. You might not be scaling it to its fullest potential, but hey, at least you're, you're reaching those different users. And that's an easy way to just get started. Awesome. Yeah. And I know that's something that uh, we ourselves were figuring out before uh, you joined Metadata. I feel like you've been at Metadata for two years uh, in the best <laughs> way possible. How long have you been at Metadata? It's, it hasn't even been has a year yet, has it? It's No, I think it's, uh, it's coming up on a year, but no, it hasn't been. I, I started off, I feel like for me it has been because I started off at Metadata as a consultant. Um, you know, helping build the product, but as like a full time, yeah, it's, it's coming up on a year. <laughs> I love it. So we've talked about where to get started. We've talked about budget. Let's get into the actual, you know, components of experimenting. So whether it's the audiences, whether it's the assets, whether it's the offer, like walk me through, all right, we've got, you know, the right first step. We've got a budget in place. How do people get started? 
to truly experiment at the end of the day. And we want everybody to know this is not a metadata pitch slap. So yes, it's easier to do this when it comes to metadata, but you'll be able to do whatever Sylvia is going to tell me uh, without metadata at the end of the day. Just might take you a little bit longer. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing kind of recapping, right? Take a step back. So step one is decide on your outcome. What piece of the funnel specifically are you trying to go after? And then also when you go ahead and actually build your campaigns because you're understanding where you're trying to reach, you can use exclusion audiences to make sure you're not diluting your efforts and reaching people in other buckets, right? So you can specify your messaging. So number one is decide on your outcome. From there, once you've decided on your outcome, then this is where you can set up your campaign structure. So if you decide, let's say, you know, keeping it really simple, I wanna focus on capturing demand and for me, the best channels to do that is gonna be, let's say for your, your ICP, it's gonna be paid search and it's gonna be, let's say, paid social. So in terms of the execution, uh, really the main thing you wanna take away is everyone has their different approach. For example, with Facebook, some people will isolate ad sets by variable. Uh, other people will do it at the campaign level. The main thing I want you to take away from this to keep it really simple is when it comes to experimentation, what you're trying to do is you're trying to isolate the, vi the variables. You're trying to isolate the variables to understand which ones are actually driving a difference for you. How you do that, I mean, I can literally, that's a whole course, like, and we could do a whole other conversation <laughs> on like oh, how, we will. how you can isolate that and like different phases and structures, but like to keep it really simple, however you do it, just make sure that you're isolating the variables so that when a result happens, you can say definitively, oh, this happened because it was this audience, or this happened because it was this ad, or this happened because it was this asset. And the way I think about experimentation is really the three A's is what I call it. So it's audiences, ads, assets. And those are the three variables that I'm trying to isolate across any channel that I'm executing on. So for example, if we're running ads on Google, the audience in this case is a keyword, right? So first, you really wanna make sure that you're getting in front of the right people. You know, If you're not getting in front of the right person, it doesn't matter what your outcome is. If you're trying to create demand, you're not getting in front of your market. If you're trying to capture demand, you're not getting in front of your market. If you're trying to revive demand and you're not getting in front of people who are marked to close lost opportunity, you know, everything else will suffer, right? So are we getting in front of the right person? Most B2B marketers are really good at this. Like they're hyper-focused on the audience and the targeting, but where they fall short is the ad testing. That's a big piece. Uh, most B2B marketers are not spending enough time focusing on optimizing and testing their ads. Or they fall into that bucket that we talked about earlier, Mark, where they're testing too many different variables of their ads, but they don't really like, drive a significant impact. And then the third key piece of focus is the asset. So what are you actually offering in the ad itself, right? Uh, you know, if, it's, if you're offering a demo, obviously, ideally, you wanna go in front of people that have some sort of no like, and trust factor, right? whether that's a, a retargeting audience because those people have affinity with you or it's an intent audience or if it's not and it's a cold prospecting audience, maybe offering an incentive like a gift card to get them to raise their hand to be able to you know, move forward. So that's kind of how I think about it. Really, you're just trying to isolate the variables. Audiences, ads, assets, the three A's. And I can dive a lot deeper if you want on the ads piece so that way people don't make that mistake of just testing ads meaning, uh, you know, meaninglessly. Oh, it's almost like you read the uh, the outline because that was going to be my next question. So we've got another, uh, I think it was our first episode at Demand Gen U on audiences. Um, I'm sure we'll have you back again at, at another episode for audiences, but there's definitely a good starting point there. I'd love to get into ads component because, you know, I lived this in two previous lives. I was just getting ads out there. They looked different from a design perspective. They sounded different and, you know, they were up and running. But as far as learning from, you know, what was working and what was not working, I had no idea what was going on. So let's run through the ad component first. Yeah, definitely. So when it comes to ad testing, by the way, the fact that they look different that you were testing, that's that's already a, a major key. <laughs> You would be surprised. A lot of people, they have like this white ad and then the other ad is like all white with like a little gray or something like just they're so similar that it almost doesn't make a difference. So when it comes yep. to ad testing, kind of like how I break up the anatomy of the ad is like into three core parts. So number one is the concept of the ad, the overall look and feel, right? Is it a meme versus like a product mock-up versus like using a person in the ad, right? The overall concept. You can also think of it as like the ad type as well. So it could be like concept slash ad type. So like image versus carousel, et cetera. But really the fundamental concept. And you, this is the first thing you really wanna test in your ads. 
radically different concepts is what you want to test first. You want to validate which concepts, ad types, are resonating with your market the most, as this is going to have a huge lift. And it's also, in my opinion, the, the most fun part of ad testing, because like you get to get super creative, and you're like, oh, let's try a meme, or let's try a video, or you, know, you can get really fun with it. So that's the first piece. Once you have identified, okay, this concept is working best for us, like let's just say memes work the best for us. From there, the second piece you want to start to dial in on is the messaging slash copy, right? The copy in the ad itself. You, you really want to make sure that you're testing, you know, if you're going after certain industries, like which, um, which pain points resonate with them, like what hooks are resonating with your audience where, you know, they're clicking through, converting, et cetera. And then depending on the stage of the outcome that you're trying to optimize for, if it's demand creation, the way you're going to measure success with your ads is like, in, in terms of like likes, comments, shares, like are you creating ideally like the best ads create value to their prospects and you're like you know you're doing a good job with your ads when people will comment on your ad and say I love this like keep it up that's that's usually a good sign so just to recap concept second is your copy and then finally third is your color so your color of the ad like orange versus blue etc if this is applicable unfortunately most B2B marketers will start with color when they're a B testing colors on a concept that isn't proven and on copy that's weak. Right? So they get marginal lifts in performance. So that's kind of how I break it down. So it's concept, copy, color. And then when it comes to copy and, and testing messaging, something that I like to do that's like super powerful, and you can just create a simple Google Sheet. And essentially you can just create one column, which is like your your hook angles. So you're trying to validate angles, and then you can take those angles and you can map them against like proven copywriting headline formulas. So like how to X without Y with this angle, or like tired of X introducing Y. And you can, you can mirror the angle to the hook template, and that can allow you to create multiple variations of copy based on proven copywriting templates. And then you can also name the ad with the angle that you're testing, and then you can validate the messaging that's resonating with your market so you can apply those insights, not just from your paid advertising, but across your website. So this is how you know this is not planned, but I think you just came up with a new offer for one of our marketing campaigns that we're <laughs> gonna run, which is that spreadsheet, because I think when it comes to uh, really direct response copywriting, most people who aren't the pros are kind of flying blind and don't really know, you know, what makes a good direct response, you know, copywriting ad. And it would be a cheat code to give away for everyone. So I think I may have to steal that from you. Um, I guess the next question that I have is it depends on budget, but many people, you know, maybe get intimidated by how many ads do I need? How many copy variations do I need? You know, what's a general rule of thumb for people who want to start experimenting more of how many different variations they need? Minimum is two, so you can A-B test, right? Like that's the bare minimum. Ideally two to three variations is a good, a good rule of thumb. What you want to avoid is you want to avoid spreading your budget out too, too much across too many variations. So like a good rule of thumb that I always recommend to clients is ideally $50 a day in budget for each variation. Um, and then you let that variation run. So like in this case, we're talking about ads let your ad spend two to three X your target cost without generating a lead before turning it off. And then that way you can allow that variation to get enough data so you can understand, hey, is this really gonna work for me or not, right? Um, and you can also automate that process of like, you know, what I like to call your safeguards or if, uh, you know, variation spends more than it should without generating performance for you, you can use automation rules like in Facebook or in Google ads to streamline that process for you. Awesome. Now we've focused a lot on demand capture and direct response ads. I think you and I both know that that is not all of what paid advertising is about. And one of the big things that we ourselves have been doing at metadata lately and many B2B marketers are focusing on is ungated, you know, content and really awareness ads. So how does, you know, that uh, mindset change or does it change when you're running, you know, ads that aren't trying to get you to do something right away? It's a huge deal. So the, there's two, two parts to this question, right? So the mindset shift number one is last touch attribution, right? If you are trying to focus on creating demand, it's a, it's a much, you're optimizing towards a different KPI. So really when you're, when you're trying to focus on creating demand, the, the true KPI you should be optimizing towards 
is content consumption. All right, you're creating this great content. You're trying to get it in front of your market. You know, we call it brand awareness, but really I think it should be called brand trust because that's what you're really after. You're trying to build trust with your market where they know, like, and love you. And the way that happens is when you actually help them and solve their problems and like create genuinely helpful content that expects nothing in return. Kind of like, you know, shameless little plug, but what we do at Metadata with our content, right? It's funny, I'm always explaining it to clients. They're like, how did you do it? We're like, you create content that actually helps people and you get it in front of them. It's crazy new concept. Yeah, yeah. crazy, crazy, <laughs> I know. Um, so, you know, yeah, exactly. And I feel like I could rant on that, but <laughs> essentially that's, that's the first thing, right? So you're not optimizing towards like a last touch, you know, lead generated, turn into a triggered opportunity, you know, turn into close one revenue, right? You're, you're really optimizing towards content consumption. And this is really like the, the, the conversation between like gated versus ungated, you know, really it comes down to what's your outcome that you're trying to optimize for and what's your goal the reason why like i sit more on the ungated side of the house is because when you just look at the math and you break it down in terms of like getting people to consume a gated asset versus people consuming an ungated asset people will consume ungated assets at a much higher rate and i actually broke down the whole math on my i did a linkedin post on it and basically like it's just so much easier and on top of that too like when you're trying to promote a gated asset like just quick math for everybody assuming you have a 10 percent conversion rate on a on a gated asset that means 90 percent of the people are not going to consume your content right um versus an ungated asset especially if you're not even driving people to a, a landing page and taking a step back here if you're promoting gated content let's see you're not even using a lead form right they need to click on your ad let's say average click-through rate is like 2%, so that means 98% don't click. Then of those that do click through, 10% convert. And then of those 10% that convert, let's say even fewer than that actually consume your content. So when you do the math and you break it down like that, you're like, if my goal is content consumption, because if people consume my content, they'll know, like, and trust me, that's where I think gated content is a little bit better. And then on the ungated content piece, you don't even have to drive people to your landing page. You can just have it in the feed and they can consume it right there. So the cost per consumption is way cheaper. So that's the first thing is how you're optimizing that. Um, and then for those of us on the house that I, and I get it, I, I struggle with this too, where they're like, well, that, that sounds good and all, but like, I need to, I need to, you know, I can't report on like cost per consumption to my VP of sales. He's going to laugh in my face. <laughs> And to those people, I agree, like we don't do that here at Metadata, we talk about pipeline and revenue. And the way I recommend to clients to report on this, um, so on the demand creation side, like on the qualitative side of the house, is you can like share with your CEO, VP of sales, like the people who are liking, the people who are commenting, you know, that they're really getting value out of it so they can go and outbound to those individuals, you know, because hopefully now there's rapport that's built up. Um, so that's the qualitative side of the house. Also, if you, you know, people who come and actually turn into a demo when they say, hey, I, I, you know, I saw your content on LinkedIn. All that stuff will help you on the qualitative side. On the quantitative side, what's really going to help you is looking at your blended cost per opportunity. By looking at your blended cost per opportunity month over month, quarter over quarter, at the end of the day, if your total opportunity volume is going up and your blended cost is going down, blended will account for the not the first touch and the last touch attribution, right? So your, your organic and your paid efforts. If at the end of the day, blended cost per opportunity is going down and volume of opportunities are going up, then you're doing a good job and you should keep doing it. Yeah, it's as simple as that. So I guess a question that I have, and selfishly, it's for me, the way that you experiment with, let's say, ads that are trying to keep people in their feed and keep them in the channel that they're on, would you approach that any differently than how you'd experiment with, you know, direct response ads where you're trying to get them to fill out a form either on your site or, you know, on LinkedIn or Facebook? Or whatever it may be? Yep. Yep. The biggest difference in terms of like the super tactical is the objectives that you use. So the other huge advantage of when you're focusing on demand creation and not just demand capture, when you're using, when you're focused on demand capture, you're going to be leveraging objectives such as, you know, conversions, lead generation. If it's Google ads or, or Microsoft, you're going to be using bid strategies like max conversions, target CPA, right? Those are the most expensive in terms of like CPM, CPCs. Um, when you're doing demand creation, another huge advantage also in, in addition to like getting people to consume your content is you're going to be able to leverage campaign objectives such as like brand awareness, video views, uh, reach on Facebook, you know, like post engagement on LinkedIn, all of these other objectives that allow you to get 
massive breaks in your CPMs on these saturated channels and lower CPC prices. I love it. So what are, uh, we're going to give away a little bit more here, not that we haven't given enough away already. What are some of the things that you're starting to experiment with right now, uh, you know, f with metadata customers, stuff that you're doing on the side with us, you know, don't give away too much, but we want to make sure people can get some new ideas too. So one of the things that's working really well for metadata customers across the board um, is if you're running any LinkedIn ads right now for conversion, so you're trying to drive leads, trying to drive demos, et cetera, free trials, whatever your offer is, if you're trying to drive conversions from LinkedIn and you're running image ads, if you're using the 1200 by 627 image ads, try a square version of 1200 by 1200. It makes your ad larger in the feed and it expands it, which obviously because it's bigger, higher CTR, higher CTR, more people will convert through. And yeah, vertical uh, or square image ads have been working really, really well across the board for like pretty much all of our metadata customers. Um, so that's something I definitely recommend to people that are, are running ads on LinkedIn and Facebook right now. Yeah, I think that was your uh, your announcement on DGMG when I finally got you on there. Uh, people <laughs> yeah, were eating yeah. that up, so that yep. was awesome. That's a, uh, that's a big one right now that's, that's working really well. Um, I have a bunch of others. I, I don't know if you want me to <laughs> kind of keep ripping off. Uh, give away a, give away a little bit. Not maybe not anything that we're testing out with metadata ourselves, but yeah. The uh, the other one too is like this is probably more on the conversation ads side of the house. So when you're offering a gift card with a conversation ad, some of the challenges with that, you know, let's assume your audience targeting is on point. You know, if it isn't, obviously you got to fix that. Uh, something I'm experimenting with right now to help with lead quality is instead of having your form and your CTA pop up on the first message, have it be on the second message. And by having a little bit of friction like that, especially if you're using a lead gen form, that's been helping in terms of quali qualifying clients. And also on that second message, you can have qualifying text. So, you know, hey, would you like to get a demo with so-and-so? Yes, second message pops up, great, just to make sure we're a good fit and you can like list out your criteria and then the form pops up. So that's something that's been working really well. And then for certain clients where if that doesn't do the trick, something else that's working even well to add even more friction is in the lead gen form itself, you can add custom consent checkboxes where people need to literally click to confirm that they want a demo request. So between those steps, that's been really good at driving higher quality conversions from gift card uh, demos. And then what you can also do in your lead gen form, but this one is like overkill, is you can actually take those questions that you had listed in the second message and add them as custom questions in your lead gen form. You can do a lot of cool things that. with lead gen forms to qualify people that people don't realize, you know? Um, and for those listening, if you're like, oh, lead gen forms, I don't know, like aside from all that stuff that I just mentioned to like help you with the quality piece, the reason why lead gen forms are better than your landing pages is because most B2B companies are not testing their landing pages enough. It's, it's really bad. Like, if you really want to drive more from not just paid, but also organic, like getting in the, the habit of like running experiments on your key conversion pages is huge. If you can just lift your landing page conversion rate from 5% to 8%, that's going to have massive downstream impacts. You know what I mean? So that's a, that's a big one. Now, for those that are already experimenting with their landing pages, are you suggesting people use something like a Google Optimize, you know, other tools? What do you typically recommend? Google Optimize is my go-to. It's free and it's, it's pretty easy to use. You are limited in the amount of experiments that you can run, but I think for most B2B SaaS companies that are just starting out, like it's more than enough and you can start to test different variations of your pages. And then last question for now, this has been a masterclass in ad experimentation and paid ads, so we'll have to do a few more of these. Where do you get you know, inspiration from for new experimentation ideas? B2C. B2C, uh, sometimes B2B, but mainly B2C. Uh, I really like following people in e-commerce. I really like following like more like digital marketers that are like doing like info products and things like that. Like those people have to sell purely based on their marketing and advertising. So they can't leave any stone unturned. I think in the B2B world, we're kind of spoiled where we have a sales team and they can do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Um, on the B2C side of things, especially if you're direct to consumer, like you don't have that luxury, like your landing page must convert. And if you can't get your landing page to convert a certain percentage, right? Or like your average order value, that's big in e-commerce, right? Like you have to add multiple product SKUs to be able to bump your average order value so that you can break even to be able to run ads profitably. 
So, you know, they don't have, uh, for the most part, they don't have like VC money where they can just keep spending at a deficit. So that's mainly where I get a lot of my inspiration and uh, definitely want to plug this into the podcast. I'm running experiments right now on TikTok and it's super early and, you know, I don't recommend people use it yet, but it's really cheap and it's, I think it's definitely a really cool platform that could be a big player in the future. So we will definitely be doing an episode on that in time because I think we're going to start experimenting on TikTok too. So uh, as long as we don't have Jason doing the, the TikTok videos themselves, I think we might be in a good It'll spot. It'll be a high conversion rate. <laughs> <laughs> we, we should A-B test you versus Jason and see who converts oh, better. Oh, God. Yeah. That'll be uh, a low conversion rate with two faces for radio. But I always awesome. recommend that to clients too, by the way, that they're getting into conversation ads. like take your, your CMO and your CEO and do an internal competition. And that's like a good way to get buy-in and you kind of make it fun. You're like, let's see who, who converts better. Uh, so that's a, that's a good tip for people. Yeah, I mean, we even did that at Metadata. And I think recently the conversation ad that's been converting at the highest clip, I think is being sent from Gil right now versus Jason. Yeah, we did it for the demand conference. Uh, results to be announced in terms of <laughs> converting better, find out in the next episode, Mark versus Jason. <laughs> oh God, that'll be like a Royal Rumble. No, kidding. Well, this is great, Silvio. Uh, I'm gonna let the cat out of the bag. We actually didn't prepare that much, but I knew that we didn't have to because Silvio is the, uh, the pro of pros when it comes to advertising. So Silvio, thank you big time for this. We'll have you on again and we could talk about this all day. I love it. Thanks for having me. Alrighty, make sure to subscribe and send us questions on LinkedIn for the next episode of Man Gen U. Thanks for coming and listening.